But it also leads me very nicely into the fact that I'm now joined in the studio by the Chief Executive of the Academy of Ancient Music, I hope I've given him the correct title, uh, Alexander Van Ingen. Good evening. Good evening, Mark. Uh, and you're here to talk about some passions this evening, uh, in a very musical sense. M- many pa- passions in the passion oratorio sense, rather than what I, what I like doing of an evening. Yes. Uh, although listening to a passion is a, a very fine pastime, I have to say. So I, 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 we're going to talk about a couple this evening, one which I'd say I'm very familiar with, having performed as a chorister in myself a few years ago, uh, which is uh, J.S. Bach's Matthew Passion, but also one which I'm, I'm, I would say I'm less familiar with, which is a, a project of yours at the moment as well, which is a Handel Passion. Now, we're doing an enormous project at the Academy of Ancient Music at the moment on Handel's only passion, and I, I confess that a, a year and a half ago uh, I didn't even know Handel had written the passion. It's not something anybody really knows. I, uh, I feel not quite so bad that no, it's uh, news, news to me as um, well. It, it's a work that he wrote. Um, I mean, it's, if we're allowed to use the the B word on a on a music show, uh, it, it it seems to be a work that he wrote uh, effectively with um, Brexit three hundred years ago in mind. Um, in so much as he had moved to the UK uh, with uh, the new King George, the, the Elector of Hanover, who had come over to to take the throne in the UK uh, or in England rather, um, and the Jacobites were getting a little bit uppity. Uh, and it, it looks as though Handel was a little bit worried that uh, his burgeoning career in the UK, where he was enormously popular for Italianate opera and for oratorio, um, uh, would be at risk. If the Jac- Jacobites succeeded in kicking George out of the UK, Handel would have to go back to Germany with him. Uh, and back in Germany, uh, they weren't very keen on what Handel was good at, uh, the Italian opera. Um, so he wrote this enormous passion setting uh, based on a very Baroque, very um, sort of high Catholic text by uh, Brockers, the great German librettist. Um, as it happens, the two of them studied law together in Hamburg University some years earlier and went on the grand tour to Italy together and what have you. Um, and he wrote this piece to send back almost as a, a job application, if you will. So there was a grand piece of oratorio for the Lutheran Church in Germany that said, if I have to go back, people will already know who I am because I've written this wonderful thing. It's, it's the equivalent of trying to get an Irish passport. So you, so you can move around uh, now. So some things don't change, you know, 300 years on. Um, and it, the first known performance uh, was in Hamburg, in the refectory of Hamburg Cathedral uh, in 1719. Um, they weren't short of rules and regulations on what they could and couldn't do. They weren't allowed to sell tickets to it. Uh, so Brockers printed copies of the libretto of the, of the text, and he sold copies of the text to people outside instead of selling tickets, um, and because he was allowed to do that, and then they could fund, fund the making of performances happen. And it is an absolutely remarkable piece of music, and it's amazing that we don't know it. We all know Handel's Messiah, of course, and I think if this piece had been in English, uh, we would know it much more. But uh, back in the early 1700s, people in, in England weren't too keen on performing things in German. Um, funnily, you'll recognise when you, if you hear that piece, you recognise about 50% of it from elsewhere. Handel lifted from his other compositions to put into Brockers, and he lifted out of Brockers into other things, knowing, of course, that his audience in the UK would never have heard this piece he'd written for Hamburg, and vice versa, and he could recycle, recycle his best tunes and his, and his best harmonies. Um, uh, and it, it's a piece that really you know, put him back on the map in, in, um, in Germany, and it's a piece which Bach heard. And not only did Bach hear it, uh, he copied it out by hand, note by note by note. And this is three hours of music for a full orchestra, and chorus, and many soloists. Um, so Bach copied it out uh, and performed it himself in Leipzig. And it was the inspiration for Bach writing his St. John Passion. And we, with passions, I think we often associate Bach came first. Bach's captured the market in passions. We know the John and the Matthew, and that's about it. We don't know about all these others. Um, uh, but actually, Handel came first, and he inspired Bach to write it. And Bach lifts bits of Handel and quotes bits of Handel uh, in his own John and Matthew. Um, but this this text by by Brockers, which which Handel set, was so popular at the time that they reprinted it. Uh, the publishers reprinted it thirty times in about ten years, uh, and eleven different composers all set. A passion based on this same text, so Kaiser, Telemann, Fasch, Sturzel, and, and Co. all wrote a Brockers passion, but Handel's is undoubtedly the greatest of the lot. Um, and the Academy of Ancient Music, uh, I guess we, um, our mission, if you like, is to explore, to preserve, to reveal this most incredible music from from times from times past, um, and to use authentic instruments of the time uh, to recreate the sound of the time and, and, in the, and play it in the way in which we believe Handel would have heard it and understood it. Um, and our mission with this, because it doesn't really 
exist uh, formally easily for people to perform. We've spent a year and a half working with manuscript sources from the British Library, from Budapest, from Vienna, from Berlin, from Manchester, from, from Wiltshire, to recreate what we believe the score is. We found 63 bars at the very beginning. There are 63 bars missing from a modern edition that we've you know located and we'll reinsert back in. Uh, we've engaged with a huge number of, of scholars, musicologists, experts, uh, particularly here in Cambridge where our, our home is, as a, a Dr. Ruth Smith, um, amongst others, a, a, a noted um, Handelian uh, scholar, Handel scholar, uh, has been incredibly helpful for us when looking at this and assessing the work and its, and its value. And it's, amazing, it's, it's incredible for me um, and for us all, I think, to, to think that this work is what made Bach go away and think, I've got to have a crack at this passion lark. I've, I've got to give it a go. I need to tell this story myself. And it's strange now to think that, that if people are looking for a piece to perform at Easter, they're often looking at something like the Messiah and looking at that, those particular parts of it, or looking at one of the Bach passions. And th- these have become a very limited repertoire. So do, do you feel this is an opportunity now to start to, to open up into, into some music like this to, to give us more of a choice I, at this time I, of year? I couldn't agree more. I mean, the handle really is fantastic. I mean, it has really great melodies. It's very easy to, to listen to as well as to, to perform. Um, uh, and it's a piece where because we're making a new edition, it's something that we will make freely available here and after. So we're not trying to publish it and make money from it because there isn't really money to be made. Um, and we'll publish it online and allow any anybody to download it. So whether you're a, an amateur performing group or a youth orchestra or a professional ensemble in another country, um, you should be able to download this piece. And a choral society might just want to sing the choruses through one Thursday night for fun, just to see what Handel did. Um, or an orchestra in France or in Peru or in Australia might want to put on a performance. And we're all about encouraging performance of this repertoire and getting it better known because, as, as, as you say, um, you know, Bach really does have a, a bit of a, a stranglehold. Um, and great though the Bach passions are, don't get me wrong, they're wonderful pieces of music, but there is, there is room, there are, there are room for, for others and for other people to have, have their say. And if this is whetted appetites of choral directors listening this evening... Is, is this similar in terms of structure and composition to the Bach Passions in the sense of you have various soloists and then uh, you have things like the, um, the the choir singing various pieces and they have the, uh, and I've, you know, the word has gone, I've got it, three it, of them lined up to play at some point this evening, the it, chorales. It, it, the chorales, yeah, it, it, it is, but yet more so, actually, uh, to the extent that... Uh, Bach sort of tells the story, uh, and, and Bach's librettist was Picando, and he sort of tells the story, perhaps just a slightly one step removed. He's telling you about the things that are going on over there. Uh, Handel's librettist, uh, the aforementioned Berthold Heinrich Brockers, um, he treats it more like a, a play, like a, a piece of theatre, an opera, a drama, and he puts you right inside it. So we still have the characters singing the, all of the, the usual uh, biblical characters you would expect in a, in a passion story, Christ, Peter, Judas, Mary, Pilate, and so on. But he adds in a pair of allegorical characters. He adds in the daughter of Zion and the, the believing soul, the, the faithful soul. Um, and they all have extended solo scenes too. And I think in a way those characters are supposed to represent how we feel when we hear the story or how we're supposed to feel perhaps when we when we hear the story. And they're actively present and they engage. They're not, as in Bach, commenting on what's going on. They're actually part of it. They're, they're inside um, uh, Jesus' experience and, and, his, and his purpose and they respond not only as, as we should do now, but as we might have done if we were there. And the, the daughter of Zion implores Pilate to reconsider his decision. She doesn't just comment on it. She's actually inside the action um, as, as a, an integral part of it. Um, uh, but yes, the, there's a, an evangelist, a, a narrator, effectively, who's, who's telling, the, telling the story um, with various uh, arias and recitatives and so on from, from the main characters. And the, the, the chorus both sing chorales and also act as a a chorus of um, the crowd, the public, the high priests, the, the town council, and, and have their say in, in that way too. Um, and it, it's such a... Um, the way Brock has puts it, it's so human and so dramatic and so telling. that I mean, He dares, and Handel dares, to set a, a duet for Christ and Mary, for, for Christ and his mother, um, which is something, you know, Bach would never dare do that because uh, Jesus is God-made man and is something, someone to be revered. But Handel says, yes, he is, but he's also a real person, and he's also flesh-made blood. And actually, he, when he's on the cross, he's probably quite frightened, and he's scared. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He, he thinks he does, he believes, but um, uh, he's in agony, he's in pain, he's in fear. And that emotion is painted so um, extraordinarily vividly by Handel, and, and by the, the language Brockers uses, 
um, are so vividly that we've had to make a new translation of the, of, of the text because the existing translations to English kind of bowdlerize it and they, they prettify it. They try and make it a little bit less gory and it's, it's a bit nice, you know, oh, he was, he was feeling a bit uncomfortable. Um, uh, whereas the, the Brockers text is full of um, gory, descriptive... Uh, when Peter, uh, when Peter's denied Christ thrice, he's begging uh, Christ for for forgiveness, um, and he he sings about you know set my set my sizzling blood on fire, my bowels screech as if on glowing coals, the wild blaze from the dark cavern of torment, and all this very baroque text. Um, uh, but in a new translation, we're trying to replicate as uh, you know, as closely as we can how Brockers wrote it in in this way that just you know, slaps you around the head and, and makes you uh, become part of the story. Uh, it sounds like it's very much putting passion into the uh, the, the word passion. <laughs> it certainly is. I, uh, I I think let's have a little bit of music now before we talk some more about this. Um, I, I picked out a piece from the, the Matthew Passion recording uh, which the Academy of Ancient Music made about four years ago. And it's always, as a chorister, one of those moments, and I think it's a similar moment in the St John Passion as well, when you have the soloist and then and the choir are singing against each other. And as a chorister, you are watching the conductor fiercely to make sure you get your entries absolutely spot on. And I don't know, I've ever got them 100%. So uh, let's hear, uh, say it, uh, Jesus had the hand, and apologies for my German pronunciation, from the St Matthew Passion. Sarah Connolly and the Academy of Ancient Music Choir from the Matthew Passion recording from 2015. Uh, and we started this evening by talking about the Brockes Passion, the, the Handel piece, which the Academy of Ancient Music is reviving, I guess is the, is the best word, and, and bringing back to new audiences and hopefully being an, an able to become part of the repertoire. Uh, so potentially, although the, the, the next performance you're doing, this is at the Barbican in London, 
uh, we could be talking to to choirs or to choir directors who are performing this very soon in in, in this county. I, I certainly hope we will be, and uh, of course we we perform a, a, a fairly regular Easter uh, passion at, at King's College in in Cambridge, uh, and I hope that in you know in in future years we'll be able to bring Handel's Handel's Brockers Passion uh, as part of that sort of regular cycle um, of passions. Uh, but lovely though it is, of course, to do the uh, Bach's Great John and uh, Matthew in, uh, in in succession. I, I think adding this. Uh, pretty incredible work by by somebody who is really one of uh, England's greatest uh, composers. I mean, albeit an, an adopted Englishman, but um, uh, it would be a, a wonderful thing uh, for us to do and to achieve. Um, and the, the the Easter story is such a, a powerful one, a, a story of, of persecution, of betrayal, of crucifixion, uh, and ultimately of, of redemption. Um, uh, that it's one which I think music tells, in a way, tells more powerfully than words. It's, it's a way that uh, listening to it and, and hearing a musical interpretation of that story when, when it's written so well by Bach or Handel or Telemann uh, or, or even Kaiser and, and Sturzel uh, is something which uh, it can have a, a very profound effect on your experience of the story uh, over and above simply reading uh, reading about it. And I, I have no doubt that the, the Brockers Passion is one of Handel's uh, uh, finest works uh, and it will gain its, its rightful place um, uh, in, in the repertory. Uh, and it's something which we've, you know, we spent a, a year and a half researching it and, and we still find new things every, every couple of weeks. I spent a couple of weeks ago, I was spending time looking for a Dorcher's Current Shrift expert to, to look at 18th century handwriting to check a few details in the score. And um, fortunately, in, in such a great uh, academic city as this, uh, one, can find, <laughs> one can find specialists uh, uh, when, when one needs them. Um, and uh, not only we, we'll perform it in Easter week on, on Good Friday, it's, it's 300 years to the week uh, from its first known performance, Hamburg Easter Week 1719. Uh, that'll be at the Barbican. It's three o'clock on Good Friday, so um, uh, you can easily get home or go away for Easter uh, afterwards. Um, and we're recording it at the same time. It'll be you know, released in, in October. Um, and in order to achieve that, uh, we've had the most uh, amazing, um, amazingly successful uh, fundraising campaign. And I'm, I'm very grateful to all those who've, who've bought an aria or sponsored the recit. And that there are, I think all the arias have gone, but there are a handful of recits left uh, uh, for anybody who, who might be interested in putting their name to, a, to the odd recitative or a role or, or what have you. But I'm, I'm very grateful uh, for that because it's, it's the Academy of Ancient Music receives no, no Arts Council money, no public subsidy. Uh, so we're entirely reliant on the generosity of supporters and of music lovers in order to be able to, to to do what we do and to explore, reveal and, and preserve this, this incredible music. And to be able to get that to people uh, where they can go and download it free of charge, uh, which yeah, absolutely. It, I mean, still I'm, feels remarkable I'm, in this day and age. And we're so proud to be, um, we're based in Cambridge, uh, of course, but we are the most listened to period instrument orchestra in the world, bar, bar none. More people listen to our recorded output online than any other period instrument ensemble. Um, and not only is that a wonderful thing for us, but it means when we put out a recording of a new work, we know it will get to the widest audience it, it possibly could. Um, and we're, we're look, talking of recordings. Uh, we're you know, back at, at King's College in Cambridge uh, this year at Easter, um, uh, playing, uh, performing Bach's Matthew Passion not once but twice. And we're doing it twice because it's uh, a live recording. We'll record it on the Monday and Tuesday evenings of, of Holy Week. That's the 15th and 16th of April. Um, and those two performances uh, will be used to create one recording. Um, it's an enormous undertaking. The Matthew is a fairly lengthy, hefty passion compared to the John, which is relatively uh, sort of tightly conceived. Um, but it's one that is utterly glorious. The Matthew has you know, two orchestras uh, as, as well as the chorus and soloists and so on. Um, and it's it's bittersweet for us uh, because it marks uh, the final Easter uh, for the uh, the inspirational and indefatigable uh, director of music at King's College, um, Stephen Clearbury, who's been there for 38 years. And we've done so many concerts and recordings with him that for this to be his last, uh, or his last with us in, in that role, um, is, as I say, it's, it's, it's a bittersweet moment. Uh, but we realised um, uh, uh, just just yesterday um, that actually we, at the Academy of Ancient Music, made its first recording with King's College Cambridge and with Stephen Clearbury uh, 20 years ago in 1999. And it was Bach too, it's Bach's Magnificat, uh, with some of the great singers um, of that time, of uh, Michael Chance, Susan Gritton and so on. Um, it's a release that is is so is so good and and so sort of recommended um, that you can still buy it today. It hasn't been deleted. It's um, on EMI, 
Uh, four years ago, we recorded the John Passion uh, with with Stephen and the choir at Kings, um, and now it's time to complete that that circle, uh, if you will, with the pair of the John, which is the Matthew, and that's that's this Easter, April fifteen and sixteen, and I, uh, we're thoroughly looking forward to that. Uh, and I, I guess it's going to be a, a, a real uh, memento feels the wrong word. It's a, a way of looking back on on that combination of that fantastic career that Stephen Cleary has had. Uh, I, I confess that I tend to fear slightly towards the John. Do you do you have a particular preference in terms of bark passions? Um, I think it depends what sort of seat you're sitting on, in honesty. And if you're sitting on a very uncomfortable seat, I'd much rather be sitting in a John than a Matthew. Um, I think, and as ever, uh, for me, it, uh, the two pieces uh, both have their strengths and weaknesses, uh, mainly strengths, uh, and, and it's kind of invidious to, to compare them. And it really comes down to who the performers are. And if you have an astonishing lineup. Uh, of soloist, orchestra, choir, as as we do uh, in April with you know the Academy of Music, Music with the choir of King's College and some some wonderful soloists. I mean, James Gilchrist is uh, he's the evangelist's evangelist. I mean, he's done it so many times and it's so fresh every time he does it. But he brings so many years and a wealth of experience to narrating and telling that story that he really does tell the story. He's not just you know reading it from a, a page. He's he's narrating a story he's uh, immensely invested in. Uh, if you have a cast like that. Um, it really doesn't matter whether it's the Matthew or the John. It's just a, a very moving, um, uh, a, 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 dare I say, a spiritual, but but certainly a very emotional, very moving evening out. Um, uh, I don't, uh, you know, um, do it down by just saying, oh, it's just an evening out. But but yeah, I mean, you know what I mean. But but for as a concert experience, any of those passions, and I, I believe the handle too, are more than worth more than worth hearing. Uh, and if you have a good cast, it doesn't matter which one. They're they're just as powerful. Let's give people a little bit more of a flavour again of this now uh, as we approach our next travel update. Uh, I'm just going to play uh, one of the, the courses, probably uh, I'd say the, the most well known for, for other musical reasons, uh, Hurt Least to Be Asu, Was Has Du Verbrocken, and then also just uh, uh, probably one of the longer pieces of uh, The Evangelist, and this is James Gilchrist from that 2015 recording, so let's hear him in action as well. Zu schickte mir den Solflegion Engel, wie für der aber die Schrift erfüllt, es muss also gehen. Zu der Stund sprach Jesus zu den Scharen, ihr seid ausgegangen als zu einem Mörder, mit Schwerten und mit Stangen nicht zu fahren, bin ich doch täglich bei euch gesessen und habe geredet im Tempel und ihr habt mich nicht gegriffen. Aber das ist alles geschehen, das erfüllt für den Die Schriften der Propheten. Da verließen ihn alle Jünger und flohen. There we go. Uh, James Gilchrist uh, performing the evangelist role in 2015 uh, and critical to the success of any performance having a good evangelist. Uh, right, I think it's time for another travel update now. Across Cambridgeshire. 
BBC Radio Cambridgeshire. Let's start off with some good news. First of all, Cambridge the A14 westbound looks like that earlier collision near to Fen Stanton at Junction 27 has finally been moved. Uh, certainly can't see any queues now on the cameras as you head up the westbound A14 towards Junction 27. Just a reminder, though, about some of the closures later. From 9pm tonight, A14 eastbound from Ellington, Junction 20, to Brampton Hut at 21. That's going to be shut, as is the eastbound A14 from the Swavesy, Junction 28, to Bar Hill at Junction 29. The A14 westbound entry slip at Histon will be shut at 9pm and the A1 is going to be closed northbound and southbound between Buckton and Orkenbury. That's all starting 9pm tonight till 6am tomorrow morning. That's the latest. I'm Adam Moore. couldn't help myself but sneak in another chorale there just after the travel. Uh, my, I, I, I could just happily sit and listen to Bach chorales all afternoon, to be honest, but that's just me. Hopefully it's you as well, dear listener. Uh, I'm talking at the moment to Alexander Van Ingen of the Academy of Ancient Music uh, about the, the two passion projects in a very literal sense that you're involved with at the moment. Uh, and I, I think we should want to make clear as well before we go any further about how people can come and see both of these. Uh, first of all, the Brockers Passion, uh, which is going to be in London. Uh, the Brockers Passion is on Good Friday. Uh, that's uh, Friday the 19th of April. It's in London at the London's Barbican Centre uh, so very near to King's Cross, easy to get to from, from Cambridge on the train uh, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon um, uh, so you have your, your evening free uh, afterwards on Good Friday um, and our Matthew Passions uh, Bach's uh, St Matthew Passions are um, at King's College in Cambridge in uh, the glorious uh, King's College Chapel uh, which unlike the Barbican is a venue where this work was, could probably have been performed in, in Bach's lifetime when he was, he was writing it uh, on the Monday and Tuesday of Holy Week that is Monday uh, the 15th and Tuesday the 16th of April um, I think tickets are available from the, the King's box office for the Matthew at King's and from the Barbican box office uh, for the Handel's Brockers Passion um, uh, at the Barbican. I mean, the, the thing looking at the the concert listings that stands out, of course, most about the uh, the Sir Matthew Passion performances, they're both six thirty starts, which uh, I guess is just a factor of the the sheer size of Bach's work. It, it, it is a, a longer work. I mean, actually, in, in honesty, the Brockers Passion is also a, a longer work. It's not dissimilar to Handel's Messiah. It'll be a, a roughly a, a two two hours fifty three hour concert, you know, including the interval. And it's similar for the Matthew too. Um, and of course, at King's College, one could just you know run late. You could start at a traditional seven thirty and carry on late, but you have to think about. Uh, you have, you have the, the boy choristers um, and they need to go to bed, um, particularly because we're recording it as well. We'll be recording you know, in the morning um, and rehearsing throughout the day. So they'll finish on Monday night, but they'll be coming back in on Tuesday morning. Um, uh, so we, you need to have that. And of course, it's a little way from the train station in Cambridge for those who, who need to, to move their travel elsewhere. So I think a, an early start is, is uh, an advisable one. And I'm very glad we're doing it. Uh, I imagine both performances will, of course, be immaculate, but d- do you imagine there might be a, a nervous sound engineer there on the second performance thinking, I, I would love this this particular movement to be uh, just very slightly different, so I have some I, editing options? Uh, there, there always is, um, and I, I mean, uh, making records in that way is, is, is what I did for 17 years uh, before I came to the Academy of Ancient Music, so I, I have been that nervous sound engineer on many an occasion. Um, it, I, I think we'll, there'll be, there's plenty of cover um, by way of having both a general rehearsal and uh, the first concert as well as, as the second one so I mean really we, we should be so well rehearsed before we go into the first concert that the second concert is not necessary from a recording point of view 
Um, and after the first time, we should everything should be there. And the second concept is, is the icing on the cake, really, that things may happen differently that are not necessarily better or worse, but that some people might, you know, the engineer, the editor, the artist might prefer X over Y. Um, and, and really, a lot of it, particularly with King's College Chapel being right on King's Parade, um, is not so much about what happens in the performance itself is what happens outside the building um, and if you have uh, someone outside who's throwing things at the window or um, is having a, a shouting match with somebody else or uh, crashing beer cans or uh, revving a Harley Davidson outside um, that ruins your recording inside so having two nights <laughs> is, is a little bit safer uh, none of these things are, are guaranteed um, uh, but having options is always a is always a good thing but this is also trying to capture a different experience of actually being a live recording. So to, to, to try and put the listener in that experience of, of being almost imagining as if they were there live rather than a more traditional recording, which you might have several takes of in a in a more studio-like environment. I, I think that can certainly happen. And you, uh, I think certainly for the performers when they're being recorded, I think that's a, it's a different experience if you know this is it and you start it. 6.30 and you're going to go from the top through to the end and, and it is what it is uh, and you need to really be on the top of your game to deliver a spellbinding um, a performance that captivates and really works through that and you're right that when you're in a studio uh, it's easy to slip into a mindset that says well if it doesn't go well it's fine we'll just do it again and again and again um, and of course but if you do it again and again and again you never really deliver deliver magic and part of the art of a, a truly great performer is to be able to turn that magic on when they're in a very dry, dead studio environment and they don't have an audience to respond to and they don't have to do it in one. But the greatest performers, of course, still can and still do it in, in that magical way. Um, so as, as with choosing what to go and listen to, I think if you have the right performers and the right cast who really want to do it together and who encourage each other, um, there's little to choose between the two if you have the right people doing it. I, I thank you so much for sharing all that about the the passions, and uh, hopefully we've whetted listeners' appetites. Uh, just before we let you go, I just wanted to get your thoughts on what became a bit of a hot topic for us last week, uh, which was trying to, to try and put together a library of pieces that we can uh, use uh, to, to reflect not necessarily the best of classical music, but the sort of widest spectrum as possible. Uh, and one thing which really came out was the, the number of people suggesting female composers, which I, I think, in my experience, uh, have been very underrepresented, and I've managed to play a few pieces by female composers during my time. Uh, and it's something that you, you've certainly... The Academy of Magic Music has performed in the last 12 months, female composers? Yes, um, over the last year in particular, we've started a, a, a new project uh, for us called From Her Pen. Um, and of course, there is um, a lot of orchestras and performing ensembles are performing a lot of works by female composers. Um, uh, and it's a, it is, in honesty, a small struggle for the Academy of Magic Music because we specialise in music uh, written between um, in the Baroque and early classical periods, so let's say late 1600s to early 1800s. Um, and there just weren't that many women writing music then, or if there were, it doesn't survive. And the, those manuscripts, those scores, just aren't available. We just we don't have them. Um, but that isn't to say that there isn't any, and there is some, and it's actually it's good, and it should be performed, and it should be better known. And for whatever reason, uh, and that's a, a, you know, a topic for another day, but it hasn't been. And we've been trying to insert at least one work by a neglected female composer of the Baroque and early classical uh, eras into each of our concerts, and we did that last week in Cambridge at, at West Road. Um, uh, it was uh, the only, uh, and I could, when I first saw this written down, I couldn't believe it, and I, I went away and did some research because I thought, this, this can't be true, this is hyperbole. Um, but it is the only symphony written by a woman in the classical period, um, or that we know mm, of yes. um, in, in, in Western music. Um, it's a symphony in C written by Mariana von Martinez, um, and she uh, she's really interesting. Um, she lived in a house in Vienna on the middle floor, had a, a flat in the middle, if you like. Uh, Haydn lived underneath her, and Porpora lived above her. And as she was growing up living here, she had lessons, uh, she had keyboard lessons from Haydn and singing lessons from Porpora. And you think these are the idea that Haydn and Porpora lived in the same house actually is, is quite an amazing thing uh, to me, let alone that she lived in the middle and could take advantage of these two musical geniuses living either side of her. Um, and the, the the greatest opera librettist of, of that time was Metastasio. And he so rated her music that when he died, he left his estate to her. And she used that to found a singing school and, and, and various other things. Um, and so many of these people have such interesting lives. Um, 
the uh, Duchess uh, Amalia of, of um, Anna Amalia of Wolfenbüttel um, uh, at court. She not only composed music, but she invited people like Mozart and Goethe, and I think she encouraged Goethe to do some of his early Shakespeare translations or something, something along those lines. Uh, and she was instrumental um, in the development of uh, what we would consider a Western culture. And um, even though she only wrote a little bit of music herself, but she was extraordinarily influential in the development of you know, Mozart's work and Goethe and, and other people like this. Had a huge library, huge collection. Um, and I think it was her, She, we know she wrote a lot of music, it's catalogued, um, but almost all of it was lost in a huge fire. The library burned down. Of course, you couldn't photocopy um, uh, stuff. So once the score's gone, it's gone. And that's the problem we have, um, actually, uh, bringing us back to the, the head of the show with Handel's Brockers Passion, is that Handel wrote it in, probably in the UK, sent the score to Hamburg to be performed. It never got posted back to him. It's been lost. We don't know where it is. There are contemporary copies of that score around which have differences, and that's why we've been doing uh, doing our extensive uh, research at the Academy of Ancient Music. But uh, the original is lost because you, it, it was an enormous amount of effort to get somebody to copy these these, these things out. Um, uh, so if you wrote it and it went up in flames, it was kind of tough luck. There's no there's no backup option. And how much music do you think they're still out there waiting to be discovered by somebody trawling through a library or, or making a, a discovery in a, a warehouse or a cupboard somewhere? I think there is an enormous amount. Uh, we discovered um, a, a month or two ago, uh, the, the, the Academy of Ancient Music takes its name from a, a group called the Academy of Ancient Music, uh, which existed in the early 1700s. There are a group of composers um, uh, like Pepush and, and co. in London who got together in a pub on Fleet Street and they called themselves the Academy of Ancient Music. Um, and they collect an archive of scores and when they broke up in 1802 they sold them all off um, individually they just disappeared uh, and we've discovered um, an archive of about probably about a third of them uh, lurking in in the archives in Westminster Abbey um, we don't quite know how they got there or why they're there but they are there and within that are some well-known pieces that, that we all know anyway but are also pieces that we've never known and we've never heard of um, and that's just one relatively small discovery. Um, a few years ago, I was working on a big Mozart project for his big anniversary, and somebody in a library in Eastern Europe found a, a missing page from Rondo Alaturka. And we all know Rondo Alaturka. I mean, this is a, a piece of music you learn when you're learning the piano as a, as a kind of, you know, grade four or five student. Um, and yet there's a, there's a wrong harmony in the middle where we've reconstructed a page that was missing and it just turned up in the middle of a load of scrap pages but it's definitely Mozart's handwriting it's it's as authentic as you as it can be um, and if that type of thing is still out there then there, there has to be so much undiscovered music it's a bit like exploring the ocean floor or um, or, or deep space but it's um, it's just cluttered libraries and it'll, uh, the libraries in eastern Europe are gradually starting to open up more and more uh, and it's really exciting for, for us and for the Academy of Ancient Music as we invest in in scholarship and research uh, for us to be exploring these uh, places that, that for some are you know, just dusty pieces of paper, but for us are absolute treasure troves, complete gold mines. And just briefly, anything else that you've got coming up over the next 12 months that is, is exciting you at the moment? Uh, we have, um, I'm particularly excited by um, a couple of more performances um, with Nicola Benedetti, the wonderful uh, uh, Nicola Benedetti, the violinist. Uh, we played with her last year um, uh, in Cambridgeshire in Saffron Walden. Um, uh, we're not back there this year, but we are elsewhere in the UK with her. Uh, I'm looking forward to that very much. Um, and we have a lovely run of Mozart's Figaro, um, uh, which is in London on July the 4th uh, at the Barbican. There's a concert performance following an opera run in Hampshire. Uh, and I, I would warmly um, encourage everybody to to come to that because it's such a um, it's a it's a kind of it's a chocolate box opera. It's it's a feel good uh, opera. It, it's not a brow beating passion. Um, it, it's a it's a nice way to spend a, a July evening out. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Alexander Van Ingen, of the Academy of Ancient Music. Uh, so I, I I had uh, had a couple of pieces in mind of female composers, but I've enjoyed our chat so much. Uh, what I'm going to have to do is is try and bring one of those back a little bit later in the show. Uh, I still got two hours to play with, so I'm sure we'll squeeze that in. I'll, I'll send you some more for another week. I'll send you some more for another week's show because uh, we've been recording quite a lot of them recently. And if you if you look at the uh, our YouTube channel for the Academy of Ancient Music, you'll see many works by female composers, some trailers for, for some arias from the Brockers Passion and other wonderful musical delights. Excellent. Uh, I, I've just about time to tell you that uh, in the next hour of the show, we'll be uh, taking our first look at three different charity concerts going on around Cambridgeshire, uh, as well as uh, looking at what's coming up around the county in the next couple of weeks. Across Cambridgeshire. On FM. On DAB. On BBC Sounds. This is BBC Radio Cambridgeshire. Cambridgeshire. 